All right, hello and welcome everyone to Oceanside Library's garden, uh, program with Oceanside Garden Club. I'd now love to introduce our, the co-president of the Garden Club, Ellen Johansson. Go ahead, Ellen. Uh, okay, hopefully everybody is, because uh, my, my internet connection is very poor and it keeps freezing up, so hopefully you can all hear me. Um, as co-president of the Oceanside Garden Club, I want to welcome all of our Garden Club members and if there are any non-members, to our first meeting of the 2021 calendar year. Our garden club was started in 1941. And during the 79 years of club meetings, uh, this virtual meeting is a first. Uh, we are fortunate to be able to use the facilities of the library to share our programs and will continue our virtual programming at the present time. We will not be distributing our yearbooks in print as we have in the past, uh, but this year due to the uncertainty of our programming, uh, we will be, our members will be receiving an email with a uh, online email uh, virtual program, uh, virtual calendar. More information about our upcoming programs are going to be sent to our members and will also be posted on the library's event calendar. I now, can, I think I, I, did I freeze again? You did not, un, you did not freeze, Ellen, you're good. I did not freeze, okay. <laughs> and um, you're good, okay. you're good. Okay, I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker for the evening. Uh, not only has Tony Antes been a master gardener in Broome County for 11 years. He has been actively involved with garden clubs on many levels. He was president of the Binghamton Garden Club twice, is currently webmaster for the Binghamton Garden Club and the Federated Garden Club of New York State's sixth district website, and is the Federated Garden Club of New York State's audio and visual committee chair. He has also served as third vice president of the Federated Garden Club of New York State. Of which we are a member. We are a member of them. And he is sixth district sixth director. He is currently the coordinator between garden clubs and master garden programs in the Central Atlantic region of state garden clubs. I am very pleased to announce to introduce Tony Antes. Thank you very much, Alan. <clears throat> I'll go ahead and uh, get our presentation started here. Everybody see, I assume you can see the picture? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> this presentation uh, came about because of me having seen numerous uh, climate change presentations over the years back into the 2000s and uh, into 2010 and so forth. <clears throat> all of them seem to have something of importance, but they all seem to lack something. So I was fortunate enough to find on the New York State uh, NYSERDA website, this report called the Climate Aid Report. It was done in November of 2011. They did a supplemental update in 2014. It's an extremely in-depth uh, analysis of climate change's impact on New York State. Uh, I'll go into the details of how they uh, structured it uh, as we go through the, the presentation. But also I wanted to bring in some information as to how uh, our scientists go about providing information from which they can uh, project what they think is gonna happen. So, I went on Google and I Googled the word climate change. I got 415 million hits in less than a second. I then used New York State climate change, got 194 million hits in less than a second. So there's lots and lots of information out there, but it's always good to try and see if you can't find the information that's really reliable. So my first part is gonna be how we determine climate change. Then gradually we will talk about globally climate change and work our way down to the Northeast and to New York State. And I've even tailored a portion of it to you folks in Oceanside. We'll look at temperatures, we'll look at water, plants, wildlife, people, 
and then we'll see if we can draw some conclusions at the end. So you can see from my picture, right now, the, the top picture with the man in the snow shovel is probably more like we would see around here, but the one down on the bottom is one we dread seeing later on. By the way, uh, you've all been muted, so if you have any questions, down at the bottom of your page, you will see a little bubble that says chat. You can click on that bubble, type in your question, and then every so often I'll have a slide that asks if there are any questions. And at that time, the host will read off the questions. I'll answer them to all of you, and then we'll go back to the presentation. So first, a few definitions. So for climate, climate encompasses the statistics of temperature, humidity, atmospheric pressure, wind, precipitation, atmospheric particles, and other meteorological measurements. And here's the important part, in a given region over long periods of time. As opposed to weather, weather is the same basic idea, but over much, much shorter period of time. So if you go on the Weather Channel, uh, Jim Cantor is gonna tell you what your upcoming weather is for the next seven days. That's not climate, that's weather. The next one is dendrochronology, a big long word that means we're counting uh, the rings in a tree because the rings in a tree can tell you a lot about what that tree went through while it was growing up. Anthropogenic, another big long word, but it's basically what is our impact as human beings on the environment, including things like biophysical, biodiversity, pollution emissions, and so forth. Greenhouse gases are obviously the gases <clears throat> in the atmosphere that absorb and emit radiation uh, that lead to the greenhouse effect. And the last is global warming potential. That's the effect of any given greenhouse gas as related to carbon dioxide. We consider carbon dioxide to have a value of one. Are there any questions to this point? No, not yet. Okay, thank you. Okay, how do we determine climate change? Talking from recent uh, occurrences to ancient occurrences, uh, tree rings would be the most current type of uh, determinant. So we can cut a tree down, we can look at its rings, and we would notice that the rings vary, and I'll show you some of that a little later. <clears throat> recorded history, a lot of history has been recorded by various entities such as states and countries and so forth. Gases trapped in glacial ice, and I'll show you a little bit about that as well. The bottom of the sea and some others as well. So what do we measure? We measure oxygen because oxygen obviously is the one we thrive on. But the greenhouse gases include water vapor. But many of us don't think of water vapor as being a greenhouse gas, but it is in fact. It's the water vapor that's in the air. You can't see it, it's not like a cloud, but it's the water vapor when someone on the Weather Channel says uh, what the water percentage is, like its humidity is 27% or 42% or whatever it is, that percentage is the percentage of the atmosphere that's made up of water vapor. Uh, carbon dioxide, of course, is the one we're most interested in tracking and, and correcting. Methane gas, methane gas is about 25 or 26 times as potent as carbon dioxide, but fortunately it's a lot less uh, in actual volume, in actual, actual percentage. And then there's the other ones like nitrogen and carbon monoxide, ozone and so forth. And as we work our way down, they are less and less in volume but for the most part, they're more and more uh, significant as far as what could be their potential effect if there were more of them. <clears throat> so let's talk about tree rings first. That picture up at the top shows an, an inset that shows the difference in some uh, bands, and those have to do with whether there was uh, hurricanes at that time where the water would have been absorbed to a greater extent and they tend to have a darker tree ring. But the main thing we're interested in is that tree rings are narrow in a poor year. So if the tree gets what it wants, proper amount of sunshine, proper amount of water, proper amount of nutrients, the tree rings tend to be wide. If it's poor, the tree rings tend to be narrow. 
And so if you look at that tree in the bottom and you start at the center, at the center is shows that the US Constitution was inscribed on paper made out of hemp instead of out of wood pulp. And that can regrow itself uh, in one year period. And then we go all the way out to the outermost ring where it says a 250 year old tree at the Superior National Forest was cut down to make toilet paper, which I think is trying to emphasize the point that there's a lot of alternatives we could be using for making paper uh, as opposed to cutting down trees. Hopefully a lot of the paper that we use is recycled paper, such as what you would use on your computer to do printouts and so forth. <coughs> <clears throat> so recorded history. The block up the top left relates to an ancient manuscript by Arabic scholars where they analyzed writings of scholars and diarists in Iraq in the period from 816 to 1009 that showed evidence of abnormal weather patterns. So it's been, weather has been recorded back that far. Actually even further, there's been a case of recorded history of weathers uh, in China that go back into the BC period. The bottom green is just a big eye chart. I don't want you to try and sit and read the whole thing, but it does show the first 30 years of recorded weather history in Minnesota, 1820 to 1869. So it's done in 10 year blocks. Notice the first one says the 1820s, cool first half, warmer second half with a closing drought. Then the 1830s, warm and dry first half, colder and wetter in the second. So we, we have a lot of records we can go by and the scientists can pull on this information to get as accurate as there is information going back pretty far back in time. Now let's go back a little further. Uh, global climate patterns go back 740,000 years in a three kilometer long ice core drilled from the Antarctic. So they go up there with a drill. The drill is hollow. It drills down into the ice. And so for, th for the first six, eight, 10 feet, it's what happened over the last 10, 12, 15, 20 years. And they drill further and further and further. And you can see the gentleman holding an ice core. And of course, they're all cataloged as they come up. And so he can, he can look at that and he can see those tiny bubbles of ancient air. They melt the ice, uh, you know, just a small sliver of it. They extract the air from it. And in the air, they can tell what has, was going on at that time. You can see the block where it says temperature, atmospheric chemistry, net accumulation, dustiness. You know, if there was a volcano erupting, there would be bits of volcanic dust in there, vegetative changes, and so forth. So a lot of information is available there. So there have been eight ice ages during that period, punctuated by brief warm spells. And we're in one of those warm spells right now. Based on our past patterns, we can expect a, our mild snap to last probably another 15,000 years. This data obviously also helps us predict how greenhouse gases will affect the climate. Tests on gases trapped in the ice core show that current CO2 levels are higher now than they have been in the past uh, 440,000 years. So obviously, uh, we can see that we have increased levels of CO2. And the idea is to try and determine uh, what has caused that. Now, the next one can go back millions of years. This is where a ship basically is doing the same kind of drilling, but instead of drilling into ice to get ice cores, it's drilling into the bottom of the ocean where it can pick up ocean sediments that go back tens of millions of years. Uh, as you can imagine, the sediment on the ocean floor is much like the ice or snow uh, that happens at the Arctic and Antarctic. Uh, this year's runoff from rivers and so forth forms the sediment at the bottom of the ocean for this year. And then the sediment just below that was last year and the year before and so forth. That sediment gradually gets built up over the millions of years, gets packed down into what would eventually become rock. But they can extract from that the kinds of calcium carbonate that are present in the types of uh, minute uh, animals called foraminifera. Uh, what happens is as the foraminifera die, their skeletons remain in the form of carbon, uh, calcium carbonate. 
and they can look at them. And as you can see in that picture there with all the various types, some of them are, are noted to live even today in warm water or in cold water or in deep water or in shallow water. And from that, they can tell also when they were living back then, what the climate was like when they were living. Obviously, as you go back further and further in time, the accuracy of this, you know, drip drops off, but at least we have something to go by rather than nothing whatsoever. So that's the point of all of this. We're collecting all of this information. The scientists collect it, they computerize it, and put it into their system to get ready to predict what's going to happen in the future. So here's some of those charts put together. The top one is millions of years ago. So you can see the, effect, the effects of atmospheric CO2, which was very, very high back in the Paleozoic time. And that's the times when uh, the trees and ferns and so forth were really lush and really growing well, because obviously the more carbon dioxide, the better the vegetation grows. Uh, as you know, our plants, they need carbon dioxide and they exhale oxygen for us. We tend to inhale oxygen and exhale the carbon dioxide for the plants. And so it's a good symbiotic relationship we have between plants and animals. But you can also see that that, that gradually tapering off as we come into the, the closer period. We live in what's called the tertiary, which is that right-hand column. Then we go down to the bottom left uh, graph. That's the graph based on the data from those ice cores that I showed you earlier. So you will notice that as the temperature drops, the carbon dioxide drops. As the temperature rises, the carbon dioxide rises as well. And once again, you could reasonably predict that anyhow based on trees needing carbon dioxide. As the carbon dioxide goes up, temperature warms up, trees and so forth do better and better and so forth, and then gradually tapers off as it turns cold. The bottom graph represents the period from the year 1000 of the year 2000. And there you can notice that it's relatively stable, somewhere between the zero and the minus 0.5 levels. But as we get out into the sort of early 1900s, late 1800s, you'll see a gradual spike. And that spike goes quite high up to the, uh, we'll call it the 0 0.75 level. The effect of that is caused by one primary effect, and that is uh, the industrialization of the world. That's the point at which we started going away from plowing the fields with horses and oxen and uh, grinding our grains with uh, water wheels to starting to use uh, internal combustion engines to drive those devices. And so as we burn coal and wood to drive those devices, of course, we were dumping carbon dioxide out into the atmosphere. Now, we had no, no idea at the time that that was a bad thing, because obviously the Industrial Revolution was a really good thing. Uh, we got higher quality food. We got more of it. Uh, people who were in poverty were able to have more of what they needed and what they wanted. So it was, at that time, of course, quite a good thing. So we benefited a lot from that. So th this is how we're putting all of this together. And you'll notice that these records overlap each other. So it provides a pretty comprehensive record of what's gone on in the past. And by past, I mean from the year 2000, or in the case of the, the uh, report, uh, from the year 2014, going back to, well, millions of years ago. So are there any questions that you have as to how we gather all of this information. Uh, hi, Tony. There was one question from your previous slide. Okay. Why, why did we stop using hemp for paper? I have a feeling it's because it's probably harder to process. Uh, I know that, you know, processing wood pulp has become a multi-billion dollar industry. So it's far more uh, uh, widespread today than hemp is. But I, I can assume that hemp today would be hard to process. Uh, that's the only thing I can think of. And, and there may not be enough places to plant fields to grow hemp uh, relative to today, relative to the amount of forests we have. 
And of course, we could, we now know that we can reprocess paper. You know, I have a recycle bin and all of my paper goes into the recycle bin and hopefully that gets to the right place where they cook it down into wood pulp and uh, reprint it. I know the paper that I buy for my for printing on my printer, which of course is just another way of consuming more paper, but at least I buy paper that shows that it's been recycled, at least 50% recycled. Thank you, that was very interesting. No further okay. questions for now. Okay, thank you. So having put together all of that information and putting that into the computers, we now wanna look at how human sources of the uh, produce greenhouse gases globally, okay? Primarily, it's through the burning of coal, uh, as far as releasing a lot of uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, so millions of years ago, plant material was transformed into coal. The burning of the coal generates a, a disproportionately large amount of CO2. Actually, for every pound of coal that is burned, two pounds of CO2 is generated because keep in mind it's a combination of carbon and oxygen. So the carbon comes from the fuel and the oxygen comes from the air used in burning it. It's the leading source of energy related greenhouse gas emissions, accounting for about 40% of the world's total. And that percentage is likely to grow as the world demands more energy. Uh, whether it's CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, or whatever it is, uh, the people are having a negative effect on our environment. So if you look at the gas source chart, we can see energy supply is about 26%. Transportation, you know, uh, locomotives, automobiles, trucks and airplanes and so forth. Residential and commercial buildings, about 8%. Industry, you know, somebody who produces products like DuPont or, or whoever like that, produce about 19%. Agriculture, of course, from the growing of crops and so forth, about 14%, forestry, 17%. Waste and wastewater is only about 3% because that's pretty well processed before it's released to the atmosphere. Then looking on the right-hand side, the gas types, you'll notice that carbon dioxide from fossil fuel use, in other words, what we, what we burn uh, across all of the various uh, methods is about 57, 57%. But if you'll notice the next three going clockwise, carbon dioxide other is 3% and carbon dioxide from the decay of biomass and deforestation is another 17%. So carbon dioxide makes up 57 plus 17 is 64, 74, and three is 77% of what we have as far as greenhouse gases are concerned. Methane is another 14%. Uh, methane is produced by the decomposition. Uh, you've often heard them talk about how cows release a lot of methane, which of course they do. There's also a lot of methane that is stored in the ice in both the Arctic and the Antarctic in the soil underneath it. And so the concern with global warming there is that as the Arctic begins to warm, that methane gas will be released into the atmosphere as well. So that's obviously a, a, a negative source. Nitrous oxide is about 8%. And then the F gas is what we call the fluorocarbon gases. They make up a very, very small percent. But individually, some of them can be extremely high as far as their relationship to carbon dioxide. But they're not nearly as important as far as their overall effect is concerned on the atmosphere. So how do we predict that? So we analyze all of that information from the past using all of the information we just talked about. And it's been updated in this case to the 2014 modeling. And then what they do is they chart that into their computer programs and then use it in forecasting. So let me stop here just briefly. And once again, go back to watching Jim Cantori on the Weather Channel when we see a hurricane approaching. And you folks are very, very conscious about the approach of hurricanes. When it's about six or seven or eight days out, you'll see them draw tracks, and those tracks are based on the US model and the European model. And the tracks always vary one from the other, uh, whether it comes from one or the other, and the tracks within the group vary. And the reason they vary is because they track the information they know about past hurricanes, 
and they look at the pressure and they look at the ocean temperature and they look at the weather and how the uh, how fast it's moving from in this case east to west and they plot it and then they say well what if this changes and then they draw another plot and they say well what if that changes and they draw another plot so that's why you get these plots that say it could go into the caribbean and hit houston texas or it could hit louisiana or gee it might turn and go up the east coast and hit some place called oceanside new york which we hope it doesn't but that's what they're doing and then <clears throat> as time goes by they refine those so as that hurricane is no longer eight days out, but six days or four days or three days, those charts get more and more accurate because they have more and more real data. They're now looking at what has actually happened over those last six or seven or eight days, so they can predict it far more reliably. So that's what we're gonna do here with this information for climate change. And in this report, they document basically three types that you see as the RCP types. The so RCP 8.5 is what I'll call worst case. We have a relatively rapid population growth. We have limited sharing of technology. In other words, the Chinese come up with a solution, but they don't tell us. We come up with a solution, we don't tell Russia and so forth like that. So that other countries that could benefit from some countries uh, technology change don't get to do so and are still producing the gases and with emissions then growing over the entire century, which is in our case through the year 2100. Now, RCP number 6.5 is partially offset by new technologies that we are now spreading that information around to other countries so that they can use it. Uh, case in point, uh, the lithium ion batteries that we have in automobiles that now allows you to drive your car either on fully electric or hybrid electric, uh, that reduces emissions right then and there. And this trajectory is associated with still rapidly increases in greenhouse gas emissions uh, for the first half of the century, and then a gradual decrease after 2050. RCP 2.5, I'll call that the uh, Greenpeace effect, if you will. Uh, this combines the population of the 6.5 level with societal changes that tend to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, resulting in the lowest emissions of the three scenarios, beginning to actually decrease by the year 2040. And keep in mind, that's only 20 years away from now. So climate change globally, here's our graph. You can see here the year 1940, 1960, 1980, 2000, the arrow shows uh, 2014 and then from there on, it's the projected. Think of it as those projected graphs that uh, Jim Cantori showed. But in this case, instead of showing where your hurricane's going, it's showing what's happening to carbon dioxide. And off on the left-hand side, you're reading carbon dioxide particles in parts per million. So we're at something on the order of 380 parts per million. Worst case is that line that goes up to something like 900 parts per million by the year 2100. And then the others, that's of course doing nothing whatsoever. And then our RCP 6 is that dotted red line. RCP 4.5 is the blue line. And 2.5, the green line, is where we're actually, if you notice, starting to taper off, starting to decrease. <laughs> that's obviously what we would like to see, you know, is that this effect we're having starts to taper off. Keep in mind, that's if everybody does something really, really well. They really, everybody pitches in and does their thing. Sort of like COVID virus. If everybody pitches in and socially distance and wears their mask and their, all of that, we in New York State have driven that down so well that we are, we're the poster child for the whole country, whereas other parts in the country are still going up. Okay, are there any questions to this point? No questions so far. Okay, so let's look at climate change in the Northeast. The Northeast U.S. weather and climate may be some of the most variable in the world. A lot of that has to do with our geographic layout. Um, precipitation is up about 3.3 inches from 1899 to 2000. Snowfall is down significantly from 1970 
to 2000. I'm sure many of you can remember these absolutely inundating snowstorms we used to have when we were kids. I can remember snowstorms that probably when I was seven or eight years old would have come up close to the top of my head. Uh, and I would lived in central Pennsylvania. Ice out of the lakes nine days earlier in the north area, and 16 days earlier in the southern region of the northeast US. Growing season has actually been increased by about eight days. Sea level increased 16 inches from 1856 to 2001. That's something we can't see. Because if you were to divide 16 inches by, what is it, 150 years, that's hardly any change at all. So if you went there at Oceanside, went, went to your ocean, you're not going to see that effect over a year or two or, or maybe even 10 or 15 years. But it's there nonetheless. The sea surface temperature has increased by about 1.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's another thing that we, don't, we can't see readily as individuals is that it's just that little bit warmer than it was the year before or the year before that. We'll see a lot more of that later. Uh, weather and climate in the Northeast are arguably among the most variable. Several factors that affect that are the latitude, the topography, and also the coastal orientation. But more research is needed to understand why this is happening. But what I say is the remarkably consistent signal of a warning trend in our region it in the Northeast, cannot and should not be ignored. So we now have our canary in the coal mine. I'm going to assume that none of you know what canary in the coal mine means, but I was born and raised in the anthracite coal regions, and I can tell you exactly what it means. When the miners went down in the coal mines each day, they would bring a canary down in a cage. And if that canary fell over dead, they got out of that mine as fast as they could because the canary was particularly sensitive the buildup of carbon monoxide. And when it quit tweeting and fell over, they got out of there and got out of there quick because, you know, way back then they didn't have a good method of evacuating the, uh, the carbon monoxide gases that were building up in the mine. So what I'm saying is from all of that information, we, we pretty much have our canary in the coal mine now. So this is just a eye chart with a mission statement. But this is what caused NYSERDA and everything to, to start up. It provides resources, expertise, and objective, emphasis on objective information, so New Yorkers can make confident, informed energy decisions. There is their mission statement. I'll let you read that. Their vision statement and their core values. Core values are objectivity, integrity, public service, partnership, and innovation. So this was not done just by one group who had only one thing and one thing in mind, and that was, you know, reduce emissions. But it was done by a large, broad brush group of people, which you will see here, I think, on the next slide. Okay, so the team consisted of uh, people who were decision makers with cutting edge information on the state's vulnerability to climate change. And to facilitate the development of adaptation strategies, informed by local experience and scientific knowledge. A state level ass assessment, which is why it's, in my opinion, so important for us in New York, of climate change impacts specifically geared to assist in the development of, of adaptation strategies. It acknowledges the need to plan for and adapt to climate change impacts to water, coastal zones, ecosystems, agriculture, energy, transportation, telecommunications, and public health. The team is composed of university and research scientists who specialize in climate change, impacts, and adaptations, private sector practitioners, stakeholders from state and local agencies, nonprofit organizations, and the business community. So this ensures that the information provided would be relevant to the decisions being made. In other words, it wouldn't be seen as lopsided to one group or another. As far as the universities, it was Columbia University and City of New York, City University of New York, and also Cornell, all uh, participated. So this is the one where I've tailored it to you folks sitting there in Nassau County. So the chart on the left shows New York State yearly max temperatures. So what they do to create this chart 
On each day of the year, from the 1st of January to the 31st of December, they record the highest temperature that occurred in Nassau County. And then at the end of the year, they add all those temperatures together and divide by 365, and they get the average, which is 59 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what it is during that period, 1961 to 1990. The chart on the right is assuming the year 2070 through 2099, the maximum temperature now in your area has gone up from 15 centigrade or 59 Fahrenheit to 21 centigrade or 70 degrees Fahrenheit, a dramatic increase uh, in, in your temperature, your maximum temperature. This is the yearly minimums. So they do the same thing, but instead of tallying up all the maximums, they take what was the lowest temperature on January 1st and so forth throughout the year, tally them up, divide by 365 and we get six degrees centigrade or 43 is the average minimum. That's gonna be more like uh, 10 degrees centigrade or 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So also a pretty dramatic increase uh, in, in the temperature that far out. So this is your plant hardiness zone and we as garden members, we, we live with our hardiness zones. I believe that your hardiness zone is now zone 7B, if I read the chart correctly. So you are relatively warm compared to us. Up here in Binghamton, we are 5B. But in 2011, you went from, five, from zone 7A to zone 7B. We went from zone 5A to zone 5B, which means basically your temperature zone went up uh, by about five degrees. So based on those projections shown on the yearly minimums earlier, by 2070, you will likely be zone 9B, which will be somewhere in the area of 25 to 30 degrees Fahrenheit as your plant hardiness zone goes. You can imagine that's pretty much south of where you live right now. And so what would that mean to you as gardeners? This is what your home's gonna look like. Those of you that live in the high tax bracket is that top level one. My house was gonna look like the one in the bottom right. That's a kudzu. I'm sure you're all familiar with the term kudzu. That's a really invasive vine that grows rampant down in the south, but is not yet established up here. Hopefully it never will be, but uh, it could easily work its way up here based on climate change. So that's the kind of future. I'm, I'm kind of hoping my house looks more like the one on the left, but that means I need a, a very wealthy relative to pass away or the Dow and the NASDAQ to do a lot better than they did the last couple of days. So are there any questions at this point? No questions so far, thank you. Okay, I'll just press on then. So now we're gonna bring this down to the New York State level. New York State, believe it or not, is 80% coastline. Now coastline doesn't just mean the ocean coast, but it's the coastline of oceans, rivers, and so forth. So there are a lot of coastlines in uh, New York State. 26 out of 62 counties are on the water. Those coastal waters are expected to rise three to eight inches by the 2020s. So we're just starting into the 2020s now. Nine inches to 21 inches by the 2050s. 14 to 39 inches by the 2080s up to a maximum of 58 or five feet by the year 2100. Most wetlands will be inundated. Salt water, of course, will extend further up the Hudson River. Uh, with storms over New York State and that level, flooding will be a problem uh, because of all of the uh, higher water tables and higher water levels. And as the water level from the storm and the lake or ocean levels will be more nearly even, runoff will not occur. So the water will simply sit there and uh, and if you will, wait for dehydration to take place, evaporation. So the projection of sea level rise is based on those three different scenarios. The red line is relative to the year 2000, but you can see those scenario lines out there that go up from, if we, if we do our very best, it's more like uh, 35 or 40 inches by 2100. If we do our worst, it could be up to like 64 inches. Uh, once again, we can't see this very well at our level as human beings, 
the places where they can actually see that are some of those small Pacific islands you've probably heard of, where their what used to be their beach front is now water, and the water is coming into their houses, and eventually they'll have to be uh, evacuated. They they won't have an island anymore. So this is a is definitely affecting us across the earth. How about plants? In the next several decades, New York State is likely to see widespread shifts in the species and the state's forests and landscapes with the loss of most spruce and fir forests, alpine tundra, and boreal plant communities. So those are going to gradually die out. Think of it as they will gradually be moving further north. Hemlocks are already dying from infestations in New York's Southern and Hudson Valleys uh, due to the uh, hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, that will continue as the temperature drops off, uh, sorry, as the temperature continues to rise and there those uh, insects proliferate. Uh, another thing will be the, the uh, kudzu, that's what you see in the top right hand corner, that hemlock woolly adelgid is what you see in the top center. A longer growing season and the potential of fertilization effect of increasing CO2 could increase some hardwood trees, provided that the growth isn't limited by drought or nutrient deficiency. And CO2 fertilization increases the growth rate of fast growing species. Think of things like dandelion and uh, uh, purple loosestrife and things like that. Which, most of which, of course, are weeds and invasive plants. Agriculture. Agriculture in New York State encompasses more than 34,000 farms, uh, which is over 7.5 million acres, contributes about $4.5 billion annually to the state's economy. A large majority of New York agriculture is currently rain fed without irrigation. So we don't have to irrigate like many places do. Anybody who's flown coast to coast from New York, to California, looked out of the window as they were going over areas like uh, Kansas and so forth, <coughs> excuse me, and see those large areas of irrigation down below, round circular patterns where they're irrigating with water from down in the water table. We don't do that here. We haven't had to because we've had enough rain to, uh, to irrigate that way. However, summer precipitation is not enough to meet all of the crops needs in most years. So the economic pr pressures have led to mergers into fewer larger farms. That's why a lot of our smaller farms can't be sustained. They simply can't uh, buy the equipment necessary to to stay viable in this kind of an environment. So they have to sell out. And the costs of adapting to climate change may intensify this trend. Agriculture is also sensitive to the volatile and rising costs of energy. So as energy costs rise, uh, you need to use more gasoline in your tractors and so forth. Uh, and that is continued to be exacerbated as well. Dairy, milk production, and some cool season crops such as apples, potatoes, and cabbages will also be vulnerable to increased summer heat stress. Uh, most of those crops don't really do well when it's really warm. And you can see up in the top picture, early season produce provides a large fraction of a farmer's income. However, uh, heavy downpours, <coughs> excuse me, particularly heavy downpours during the springtime can uh, damage the crops and greatly reduce their uh, uh, productivity of uh, resources. Maple syrup, we all love maple syrup. That's not gonna dramatically change. They expect it to be slightly declined and the window for trapping, tapping the trees will be earlier <laughs> by about a month. Currently the best time to tap are within an eight week window from late winter to early spring when temperatures cause freezing at night and thawing by the day. Insects and diseases and weeds. Climate change will affect the crop weed pest complex. 
that will favor the crop in some cases and lead to reduced use of some chemical controls. However, as New York warms, insect and disease pressures are likely to increase pesticidal loads. So here's an example. Currently in New York, if you're growing sweet corn, you spray between zero and five times per year insecticidal applications to kill the larval caterpillar-like insect pests you see in the two pictures. If you are today down in Maryland or Delaware growing sweet corn, instead of the zero to five, you're using applications of anywhere from four to eight times per year. Florida, they require up to 15 to 32 applications a year just to bring in their sweet corn. So therefore, the warmer temperatures tend to translate to increased pest control measures, causing significant economical costs for growers and environmental costs for society. So if you're a farmer and you have to spray more often to bring your crops to, uh, to market, that cost has to be passed on to the consumer. So just the one example, corn is gonna cost a lot more. Farmers who use basic IPM or integrated pest management are likely to be more successful dealing with climate change. Basically integrated pest management has to do with you uh, using the most, uh, or, or let's say the least intensive form of insect and pest control necessary to accomplish your task. So if you can do it by growing, let's say, uh, crops that resist uh, insects, uh, tomatoes, for example, that resist that late tomato blight, if you can do it that way, that costs a lot less than if you have to spray a lot. So that's what we're talking about with integrated pest management. Adaptive management will require increased investment in both consultants and in skilled employees, because most of these things require significant training in order to do them properly. And so that will obviously be uh, expensive as well. Are there any questions to this point? Yes, actually, we have one question. Okay. Why is why is Roundup still being sold if cancer causing and, to and it's toxic to the environment? I honestly can't answer that question for you other than some form of demand for it. We all know that supply and demand tends to drive almost everything. And uh, I, I, for example, no longer use it. I have a bottle of it, a container of it in my garage. I haven't opened that, I'm sure, in. 12 or 15 years, but I simply haven't gone to uh, the proper place to dispose of it, but I certainly don't use it. And, and I, I have no idea why, it, uh, other than it's just not yet considered so hazardous and so potent that they will take it off the market. I mean, you can see that with, with various drugs and so forth. If you see a drug advertised on TV, they'll say it's wonderful for this, and then they'll give you a whole litany of things that it may cause. You, you can't eliminate that drug because it's so efficacious for one thing. <clears throat> and Roundup obviously is beneficial at what it does. It's the side effects that are bad. And, and I, just, I just can't explain why they don't simply take it off the market. I agree with you, they probably should. But uh, I have no explanation as to why they don't. Thank you, Tony, good point. Sure. And sure. Um, that's it for now, no further questions. Okay. So how about the effect of climate change on people? So their top center is the Lyme disease tick. That's obviously going to be increased with an increase in uh, warmth because they tend to thrive in that. Lyme disease, asthma, and salmonella all tend to thrive in the warmth. Asthma, of course, is gonna affect a lot of people. <clears throat> Vulnerable people in communities will be at risk of more frequent or severe health problems. Uh, we're not used to the extreme heat that they would see in the, in the southern part of the country. Uh, people with asthma are particularly vulnerable to both ozone and fine particle air pollutions. Uh, so an example would be changes in climate <clears throat> are expected to change the habitat for the tick vector of Lyme disease. So as the temperature warms up, deer will tend to 
proliferate more as if they aren't enough. And that increases the potential for ticks, which in, end, uh, in turn will increase the likelihood of Lyme disease among people. The particularly vulnerable population groups, the elder, elderly, obviously, and that certainly includes me, children, because children are out playing a lot, people with asthma, because it attacks the lungs, those with weak immune systems, think of what they're talking about with people who get COVID virus, those with low incomes who can't afford to buy even the over-the-counter uh, prescription uh, drugs that they might be able to use. Athletes was one that stopped me dead in my tracks when I first looked at it. I thought, gee, athletes are very healthy. However, athletes are out in the environment working. Uh, think of football players, baseball players, hockey players, and things like that. When you work that hard, you're breathing really heavily. You, you're your, your breathing rate is high, so you're drawing in more and more of these particles that are in the air, so it affects athletes pretty significantly as well. The same with outdoor laborers, and of course, residents of coastal cities that I might mention has to do with people who live in a place named Oceanside. So people in ozone, the current ozone standard is 75 parts per billion, not million, but billion, set by the EPA back in 2008 and is still considered to be too weak. In 2020, continental United States paid about 5.4 billion in health impact costs associated with the climate penalty just caused by ozone. <clears throat> the higher ozone also led to about 2.8 million more occurrences of asthma attacks shortness of breath, coughing, wheezing, and chest tightness. By 2015, that could rise from 2.8 to 11.8 million. Ozone has led to an average of 944,000 more missed school days in 2020. By 2050, that could arrive, rise to 4.1 million missed school days. And this has been especially true in larger cities, such as New York City, you can see on that graph up there, if you look at the parts per billion of ozone in New York City, when the temperature's around 50, it's down around the 45, 50, going up maybe to 60. By the time the temperature's up to 100, uh, the parts per billion is 210, 215 parts per billion. And that's from all of the exhausts and everything that's in the city and uh, any burning of carbons in your uh, furnaces and things to heat. And of course, the, the, just the heat zone itself, because cities themselves have not enough greenery to tend to keep their temperatures down. So they tend to be much warmer than the surrounding uh, environment. Ozone can also be found most severe in urban areas and it's unhealthful ozone labels, uh, levels can also be found downwind of cities and power plants because Obviously, the wind causes it to drift that way. People in transportation. Transportation, cars and trucks account for about 34% of the total carbon emissions in our state. In January 28, 2012, California passed sweeping auto emission standards that mandate 1.4 million electric and hybrid vehicles by the year 2025. Automakers worked with the board and federal regulators on the greenhouse gas mandates to create a national standard. So California began passing their regulations for cleaner cars in the 1960s and helped to spur the, histories, the in industry's innovations Currently, 14 other states, including New York, have adopted the California smog standards as their own. And automobile companies such as Ford, Chrysler, General Motors, Nissan, and some others have submitted testimony supportive of the new standard. So state and local governments can further reduce vehicle emissions by investment in public transportation using low emission vehicles. We here in Binghamton have uh, uh, some of our local buses uh, that run on, uh, uh, can't think of the name of the gas anymore. Anyhow, they run on uh, 
a natural on natural gas because the emissions there are, are basically nothing but water. So they are a very low emission vehicle here. But of course, as you know, most people have a hard time giving up their automobile in favor of uh, mass transit. Are there any questions? Yes, actually, we have one question. Could the warming or change of climate be contributing to the rise of sinus allergies? Oh, I have no doubt it probably does because this, your sinuses, as they dry out, they tend to be irritated more by any particles that you inhale. So yes, I would certainly think so, yeah. Thank you, that's it for yep. now. Sure. So this is one of the most striking charts, I think, in the whole presentation. This is a summary of global warming observations. Now these are observations, these are not, this is not guesswork. During the 20th to 21st century, the rate and duration of warming is larger than at any time in the past 1,000 years. The 2000s are the warmest decade of the century in the Northern Hemisphere, where we live, of course. 2016 has been the warmest year ever recorded, and the Southern Hemisphere and parts of Antarctica have not significantly warmed. So take a look at my news flash. As of now, as of this year, the 18 warmest years in their order, and these are on, on record, 2016 is the warmest, 2019, last year, second warmest, 2015, 17, 18, and so forth. And you'll notice only two of them, 1998 and 1997, are out of the 2000s. So we continue to hit higher and higher global warming. So that, that doesn't necessarily mean that New York State was higher, but overall global warming, uh, the 18 warmest have been 16 of them in the 2000s and the other two, 1997 and 1998. Atmospheric water vapor has increased several percentages per decade over the Northern Hemisphere. Annual land precip has increased in both the middle and high latitudes in the Northeast, uh, Northern Hemisphere. Decreasing snow cover and sea ice uh, also has occurred, though this is also not true in the Antarctic. Global mean sea level rise has been observed at the rate of about one to two millimeters per year. Increase in heavy and extreme precipitation events in regions where the total precipitation has increased. And quite often that precipitation increase is not spread out evenly. If we were to increase maybe five, 10, 15%, and that was spread out over the year, that wouldn't be so much of an impact as it is when it occurs in large downbursts. We suffered two major floods up here, one in 2006 and one in 2011. Uh, I could look out my front door down to the fire station at the bottom of my hill and watch the helicopters bringing people from off their rooftops down in the main part of the town I live in, which is Conklin, New York. Uh, it was kind of bizarre to see that when the sun was shining and it was a beautiful day and I was out in my shirt sleeves getting my mail out of the mailbox. So now we'll do some observations and some projections for New York State. Observe changes in New York State. Annual average temperature in New York State has risen 2.4 degrees since 1970, with the winter warming by more than average up to 4.4 uh, degrees. Sea level on the coastline has risen 12 inches since 1900. And intense precipitation events like heavy downpours have increased. That's what I mentioned earlier about if the if the down if the rain was spread out more equitably, we could handle it better than we can with heavy downpours. So, based on what we do know about New York State, here's the projections. Climate models will, with a re range of scenarios, suggest temperatures increase in New York from 1.5 to 3 degrees in the 20s, 3 to 5.5 in the 2050s, and 4 to 9 degrees in the 2080s. Sea level rise for the coast and tidal Hudson River 
based on climate models. Coastal waters are expected to rise three to eight inches by the end of the 2020s, nine to 21 inches by the 2050s, 14 to 39 inches by the 2080s, to a maximum of 58 inches or almost five feet by 2100. I suspect those of you living in Oceanside can go out to your seashore right now and you could look at that and say to yourself, what would it be like if the ocean right now was anywhere from 14 to 39 inches higher and you would see the effect that might occur by the year 2080? If the melting of the Greenland and West Antarctic ice sheets continues to accelerate, the sea level rise could be even greater than these projections. So a rapid ice melt scenario based on observed melting and paleoclimate records, those are those ice core drillings, yields a sea level rise of between 37 and 55 inches instead of the 14 to 39 mentioned in the bullet above. So you can see that uh, we, don't, we don't want to see this. That kind of strange looking picture in the upper right hand corner, that's what the tip of Manhattan Island would look like with a 48 inch sea level rise and them doing nothing to protect, protect Manhattan. It would take a sea wall of what, 48 inches plus to prevent that from happening. Maybe we could just uh, turn Manhattan into uh, 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 the New York State equivalent of, of Italy and uh, have gondolas going around New York. Are there any questions? No questions for now. Okay. Oh. So what can be done to reduce the anthropogenic effect? Remember anthropogenic effect is the effect of you and I. So we can reduce emissions from power plants, refineries and vehicles by investing in more fuel efficient cars and reducing the mileage driven. I suspect all of us are driving less miles than we did before COVID virus hit. In addition to that, I drive a Ford Fusion hybrid energy car, which is a both plug-in and gas engine. Because I drive only short distances to the grocery store and back, uh, I am currently getting about 260 miles to the gallon because I use hardly any gasoline at all. If I go to my nearest grocery store, and drive home, I don't use any gasoline at all. I plug it in, it charges the battery. I get about 25 miles on a charge. It's less than 12 miles at the grocery store. So I get to the grocery store and back, plug it in, and I haven't used any gasoline at all. So that's my contribution. Developing fuels that are less carbon intensive, and that's things like natural gas and so forth. Providing good public transit. Once again, it's the kind of thing that gradually is taking place over the country. There are more and more buses that are both uh, electric and also using uh, natural gas and so forth. Increasing the energy efficiency at industrial commercial facilities. That to me tends to be almost a no brainer because those industries, if they do that, they can crank out their product at a lower cost. And I would think that that would be a, an incentive for them to do more of that developing and retrofitting homes and buildings to be more efficient. So if you had a, a home with single pane windows and you put in double pane windows, that would obviously be a benefit. But if you put in those newer triple pane windows, that would be even greater benefit. Adding insulation, uh, things like that. Uh, retrofitting homes to more energy efficient uh, appliances and so forth. Every place where I used to screw in an incandescent bulb, I now have LED bulbs. They require about 90% of the, sorry, they save about 90% of the electricity. So a bulb that puts out the light of say a 100 watt light bulb that used to use 100 watts, takes about 12 watts to do that. So I have seen a significant reduction in my electric bill doing that. Using more renewable energy sources such as wind, solar, and geothermal. There are a couple of places within uh, I'll say 50 to 60 miles I can drive and I can see solar panels in a farmer's field or I can see uh, wind driven uh, electricity generated on, on some of the higher hills. There's some down in Pennsylvania as well, just south of me. 
Ensuring that ozone and carbon reduction standards are strong enough to be truly protective of, of the public health and to work with our global partners. And that's, this is obviously a significant one too because it's difficult to work well at reducing your global em your emissions here in the US if China or Russia or any other country is still producing uh, a lot of greenhouse gases. So it has to do with, with working with our global partners. So my conclusion to all of this is the time to act is now. And if we do not, then the canary in the coal mine will have fulfilled its ultimate destiny. And that's that poor canary that died from those carbon monoxide fumes down there in the mines. So that's the end of my presentation. Are there any further questions about any part of the presentation? Um, there's no questions right now, but maybe uh, we'll leave we'll leave a minute or two more in case anyone now that the presentation is over. If anyone has some concluding questions, yeah. If, if anybody has questions now about anything I did in the presentation, go ahead. Please let me know. I'll be happy to try and answer them for you. Thank you. In the meantime, thank you so much, Tony. That was really a very, very uh, educational lecture. I really appreciated it. Thank you so much. Very good. I'm, I hope everybody got something out of it. All right. Maybe while we wait, I'm going to end the recording here, right? Hold okay. on one second. All right.